So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my, uh, my deep pleasure to call the IEEE Cluster 2013 conference into full session and welcome you to Indianapolis to IEEE Cluster 2013. I want to thank the sponsors, uh, Cray and DDN, who are gold sponsors. Uh, very, very much deeply appreciate their sponsorship. Uh, IBM as a silver sponsor and uh, Matrix Integration and Hewlett Packard as uh, bronze sponsor as well. Uh, our corporate sponsors contributed uh, mightily to uh, uh, this conference and their sponsorship money uh, went in part to do things like put good food on the tables at meals and also to support student participation in the conference. Uh, I want to thank the not-for-profit sponsors as well, uh, Case Western University and then a number of universities that are all members of the Coalition for uh, Advanced Scientific Computation. Uh, University of Chicago Research Computing Center, Clemson University, Georgia Tech, uh, University of Miami, Mississippi State, University of Notre Dame, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the best private school in the state of Indiana. Um, <laughs> and uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center and uh, uh, UCSD. Uh, I also want to thank and acknowledge the National Science Foundation. So one of the things that we did that's new with this conference is submit a proposal to the National Science Foundation which supports the presence of many of the students that are with, with us here today. Uh, just a very, very quick note, the Pervasive Technology Institute uh, at Indiana University is hosting this conference. Uh, as part of our efforts to be engaged and participate in uh, the national uh, scientific and computing uh, community, we exist uh, through the generous initial support of the Lilly Endowment, which is a private charitable trust created by the, uh, the children of uh, uh, Mr. Lilly, who founded L Lilly Drug Company. And now, to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, David Keyes is Professor of Applied Mathematics and Computer Science at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he is the uh, founding dean of the Division of Computer and Electrical and Mathematical Sciences and Engineering there. How cool is it to go to create a brand new university and essentially create a new school from the ground up? Uh, this is one of Dr. Keyes uh, major organizational accomplishments. Uh, his scientific accomplishments are focused in uh, the area of algorithms, and I made a list of bullet points because otherwise I would have forgotten uh, one of the major awards that he has been uh, given in his career so far. Uh, fellow of uh, SIAM and AMS, uh, the Sidney Fernbach Award, ACM's uh, Gordon Bell Prize, uh, and the 2011 Siam Prize for Distinguished Service to the Profession, which I think is uh, really, really significant. With no further ado, I am going to happily turn the podium over to Dr. Keyes. Thank you, Craig. Greetings, colleagues. It's a wonderful honor and privilege to set a keynote for IEEE Cluster 2013. After I scrolled through the abstracts of the conference in detail last week and understood the affinity of some of you to my own technical interests, I was tempted to scratch my original uh, talk and go directly to some of those shared technical interests. However, that would be too narrow a use of the keynote that Craig and I had planned after getting to know each other uh, for about a year and a half charting directions at what was then the Office of Cyber Infrastructure at the National Science Foundation. So in keeping with the purpose of a keynote, I will try to be expansive and reflective on the role of scalable computing in the university of the 21st century. I will do this from the perspective of a university that has known no other century, and indeed is still in its first half decade. And you could question whether a university so young had anything by which to inform its sisters. Uh, and from track record alone, of course, the answer would be no. But uh, the advantage of a university that is very purposefully planned as opposed to randomly evolved over decades or centuries, is that a lot of talented consultants, very probably a few of you here, were involved in helping to set up this experiment. And its philosophy should therefore be a very contemporary interest. What would you do differently if you could start over, is the question that the Kaus team asked as it toured many uh, university presidential offices in the US, UK, and uh, Europe, and Asia. 
Um, so uh, Kaus' future also depends very much on the future progress of the community gathered here, because having flung itself on computing, in part, for the enablement of a mission in a fairly unprecedented way, it will succeed or fail in large part with the achievements or disappointments of scalable computing in science and engineering, and indeed as, as a uh, focus of education. There are many tributaries uh, into this talk and branches off of this talk that I have pruned in order to attempt to fit it into the time allowed, but this means that you can customize afterwards with questions, and I do hope to leave time for that uh, with, with interaction both uh, on the podium and then um, I'll be around all day and through the receptions and posters and so forth. So I do look forward to meeting uh, many of you. Um, the title that I've chosen uh, as sort of a, a runner here is To Compute to Breathe. Um, I think you'll probably all agree with uh, that in the sense that, uh, well, let's see, computing uh, is essential, uh, it's natural, and it's available in the sense of access and cost to any university, just like uh, breathing is to any person. And I skipped the map, the pinpricks on this map show where you have been over these past 14 years. And the, uh, the white circle is uh, where I'm uh, coming uh, to you from on the coast of the Red Sea. In fact, I live uh, in a villa on an island in the Red Sea about the latitude of Maui. It's a very attractive uh, environment. Uh, I notice that in all of Africa and the Middle East, um, you know, this conference hasn't yet made an appearance and maybe uh, it'll be appropriate to do so in less time than, than you imagined before uh, you know, hearing this uh, talk. Um, so even though uh, we, I think, would all in this room agree about the uh, potential contributions of, of scalable computing to a research university, um, there's a whole crop of, of uh, new research universities that have been founded after KAUST, which to my surprise are not built uh, around uh, this foundation. Uh, and this makes KAUST an even more, perhaps, uh, interesting experiment to many. Um, when we were launched in June of 2009, and I remember well uh, the uh, posting of that, the top 500 list that year in Hamburg at the ISC, uh, Saudi Arabia suddenly found itself a third in the list of nations among uh, you know, computing uh, capability following uh, the US and Germany. And that was one of the earliest appearances on the list of the I, uh, IBM Blue Gene P, and you see all the occurrences of that in, in red, and that's the system that uh, we chose uh, to launch our uh, university. Uh, that machine, that fixed machine, is now third in the country, so time evolves and machines slip, but we're in the market for a new machine in 2014 that should put us back in the top 20. Uh, it, it would be the top 10 today with about five petaflops, but uh, of course, uh, even a year is, is uh, uh, you can slip quite a bit on that list. Now, what about computing at other startups? Here are some notable startups that have occurred uh, since KAUST in 2009. The, the Mazdar, Mazdar is the Arabic word for source, Institute of Science and Technology in Abu Dhabi, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, the Nazarbayev University, named after the president of oil-rich Kazakhstan, the Skolkovo Tech, which many of you have uh, probably heard about, uh, started under Medvedev uh, in, in Moscow, uh, Shanghai Tech, uh, started by uh, the son of Zhang Zhimin, uh, a PhD in material science from Drexel uh, in a, a very well-placed square kilometer in, in downtown Shanghai. Uh, the new Hamid bin Khalifa University, which is being organized by Thomas Zachariah, whom many of you know from uh, the number two position at Oak Ridge National Labs, uh, taking advantage of the interest of the Qatar Foundation in going big on, on research universities and a new medical school. So these are all new graduate research universities with major international partners, admirable missions, bold web pages, and seemingly very strong financial backing and, and influential high-level government backing. Uh, in many ways, they're following a KAUST model, yet computing is not really, from their web pages, a detectable curricular or facility uh, priority. So I think it's, it's uh, you know, important for the credibility of our field that these major starts uh, pick up on, on computing as an essential part of the university. So with that as an introduction, uh, this presentation will give a little bit of background to scalable computing at KAUST, and a, it will sing the hymns of you know, the motivation of why uh, scalable computing should be important to any 20th century university, and then I'll spend the last third of my talk uh, indulging myself in some descriptions of some research highlights in my group uh, at KAUST today. So the purpose is, first of all, to try to be encouraging 
but cautious about the hurdles. We're in this together. We have to work hard at the frontier. Uh, and then to lead into a productive uh, discussion period. So part one, uh, Kaust and computing. Um, there's nothing like a curse of high expectations. And uh, in 2009, a month after we launched, Science Magazine ran a lengthy article on us about uh, the expectations uh, on Kaust uh, as, as a uh, university in support of sustainable technology for the arid uh, regions of the world, energy, environment, food, and water. There's a snapshot of most of the initial faculty, two-thirds of which was from US and Europe, and uh, of the student body, two-thirds from the Middle East and Asia. Amusingly, as you can see over in the bottom right, the top three countries in the initial class were Saudi Arabia, China, and Mexico, another oil country, actually. And many of those students have, uh, have actually stayed in Saudi Arabia since uh, graduating. Um, we still have a ways to go, and Science Magazine was happy to remind us of that with a, with a follow-up, even larger article in December of 2012. Um, you can, if you're interested in starting a university, this is recommended reading, uh, and uh, uh, you know it's, uh, it's it will help you to fill in a little bit of, of our background and our mandate. Uh, to specialize down to computer science and electrical engineering, <clears throat> these are the two largest and, as it turns out, most selective majors at Coast. By the way, we're a graduate-only university. Uh, we have had the largest number of graduates in those areas, um, mostly masters. Just the PhD trickle is starting to. Uh, develop into, into a flow as we hit the five-year mark this year. And these two areas draw overwhelmingly the largest number of applications, uh, both from the region and uh, our international student body. We have students from 70 countries at KAUST. Um, also, KAUST may have the highest number of women students of any graduate school of engineering that I know of anywhere, including the US. I came from Columbia, where uh, the, the women comprise 26% of the engineering school here. Uh, it's 36%, and it's also rich in, in regional women who, who find uh, you know, it less easy to, to travel abroad. And this is helped by computer science and electrical engineering. Uh, our, our totals are higher than the university average, along with biology, in part because the, the work environment of, of a computer science professional uh, you know, can be a desktop environment. You don't have to be out on an oil rig or whatever. And so it's considered a, a, a good career platform for, for talented young women. Uh, the three programs of CS, EE, and Applied Math and Computational Science had been quick starts. We, didn't, we weren't waiting for labs to be set up uh, and, and various uh, agreements with customs in terms of importation of samples or uh, you know, different uh, things that are, are new to uh, a, a country in terms of what are all these requirements uh, for, for research. Um, the, um, so, so we got out of the you know, box in a hurry. We, we had our big computer set up before the students and faculty got there. And uh, we've had, I think, a very encouraging performance if you look at the kind of metrics that provosts and presidents are interested in in terms of Thomson Reuters uh, rankings. But all four of the new initiatives since operations began have partly in response to the student demographic been in these three areas of CS, EE, and applied math. Another aspect of uh, progress that you would be interested in at this meeting is the, the facilities angle. Uh, we did start with our flagship uh, supercomputer, a 222 teraflops IBM Blue Gene P, named Shaheen after the Arabic word for falcon, which is the fastest animal. It has approximately 200 users, over 50 active projects, a good percentage of which scale to the 64K uh, uh, cores on the machine. Over a billion core hours have been utilized by ourselves and our, our international partners. In terms of Linux clusters, we have, we have several, including the flagship Noor, which comes from the Arabic word for light. Uh, it has approximately 650 users, 100 active projects in the distributed computing mode, and over 250 applications maintained. We have a couple of recently built experimental clusters of Xeon Phi and Kepler, early access donated by uh, their, their companies. And we've had training workshops, even this week we had a a workshop on uh, the Kepler, which drew 150 uh, students, faculty, staff, people from the region in terms of industry or other universities. Um, nine vendors now serve the region. When we started, IBM was the only one that could offer on-site support. Now all the major vendors are in the bidding process for our next machine. Uh, last year, we hosted the Saudi HPC User Forum the week after supercomputing. It had 315 registrants. That grew from 25 two years before. So HPC is gaining invisibility among Saudi government agencies. 
uh, and companies as well as the other universities. This is our university logo. It has many interpretations. I, uh, one of the interpretations I like to give it is uh, the four pillars of sustainability, uh, which we were chartered by the Royal Court of Saudi Arabia to work on. And I always add in computational science as an enabler. We're not one of the headliners, but we undergird all these different efforts, which are you know, a combination of experiment theory, simulation, and data. And that's the other way I like to look at our logo, is representing the four ways of knowing. Theory going back millennia to the Greeks. It began to be corroborated with experiment just centuries ago. And most of the world's uh, great research universities were founded and evolved in that mix of you know, the scientific method of, of comparing theory and experiment and reproducibility and, and, and so forth. Um, then, uh, you know, about 50 years ago, simulation came along as a force, uh, starting really uh, with, with von Neumann at Los Alamos in terms of trying to solve practical problems and growing to, you know, the, the SIDAC program, the ASCII program, uh, genuine um, agency decisions made uh, on the basis of simulations alone in many cases. And within the last decade, we've seen big data emerge, the volume of uh, digitally stored information doubling about every year. And KAUST was uh, fortunate enough to be founded downstream of these other two revolutions in the, way, uh, the ways of doing science, and was uh, founded with a fairly good balance among those. Whereas many of the institutions with inertia and, and prestige are uh, still firing on just two of those four cylinders. Um, this, is a, this is not data, this is just a schema that I like to show in terms of the relative percentage of, of scientific effort uh, devoted uh, to, let's say, experiment and observation versus simulation and prediction. So uh, back in 1950, when digital computers first came into use for nonlinear problems like weather prediction and neutron transport, they were more or less a curiosity to try to explain things that, were, that defied theory, you know, nonlinear equations, no, no uh, uh, you know, use of the traditional analytical uh, techniques that lead to closed form solutions. And uh, things could be, um, you know, try, maybe explained with very uh, low resolution computing. Uh, by the year 2001, we have the bold declaration of the Scientific Discovery Through Advanced Computing Program of the U.S. Department of Energy uh, saying that, hey, we're going to actually uh, do scientific prediction and engineering design. Uh, resolution is high enough, speeds are high enough, multiple decades of natural phenomena can be resolved and integrated for long periods of time. Uh, computing is here to stay. And then, of course, we were founded downstream of that philosophy. So at many typical research institutions, uh, the emphasis is on uh, the, the discovery through experiments and then understanding by computing. But the future will certainly be for cost effectiveness, among many other reasons, prediction by computer, and then verification uh, by experiment. And notice the, the computing margin never goes to the upper right. There's always a, a, a large gap that needs to be closed by very expensive experimentation. And let's remind ourselves we're talking in the tens of billions of dollars for ITER in France right now, the world's uh, largest thermonuclear uh, fusion reactor. And, uh, you know, four billion for the uh, NIF at, at Lawrence Livermore and so forth. So these experiments are extremely expensive. They have to be undertaken globally. Simulation, although the facilities are not cheap, are relatively very inexpensive and, uh, of course, uh, can be done in a globally distributed way and should really be done before those expensive experiments are turned on. So this, this is my own philosophy. This is the SIDAC philosophy. This is what we're trying to reproduce. Um, KAUST was, was given three missions uh, by the Royal Court, advanced science and technology, catalog, uh, catalyze economic diversification in a country that's primarily extractive, moving to an information service economy, and connecting Saudi Arabia to the best practices in research and academic culture. One could wait a century following the leaders to try to emerge at the other end, uh, but the, the uh, impatient, ambitious uh, country uh, said, no, reinvent the university. Uh, do what you need to, do what others find less natural in order to uh, try to uh, find a niche. And so we have, a, I'll, I'll go through a fourfold strategy very briefly here, the first one of which is obvious to any academic administrator, uh, multidisciplinarity. Everybody tries to do it, gives it a lot of lip service. It's impeded at a lot of institutions by fiscal and faculty counting territoriality. We managed to avoid that by not having undergraduate programs. 
and by setting up research centers that for the large part fall between the disciplines and infusing most of the university's financial resources through those topically oriented centers as opposed to through deans. Another uh, you know, nice feature is that science and engineering are integrated. They're not separate schools under separate deans. And uh, the uh, overall uh, you know, spirit of, of the campus is to try to make progress on problems. It's more really, a, a, you could say, of a, of a DOE lab that has a, you know, a significant curricular uh, add-on. So these are the founding nine research centers, two of which are in the general area of, of math and computer science, the Computational Bio uh, Science Research Center and the Scientific uh, uh, Visualization uh, Research Center. The others are related to those four pillars of energy, environment, food, and water that I mentioned. And it's through these uh, centers that the projects originate and are funded, and the divisions then uh, staff them up with, with faculty and, and students. Since founding, we've created four new strategic initiatives, all of them in the IT or, or EE area, solid state lighting, uh, extreme computing, uncertainty quantification, and the numerical simulation of porous media. Our second strategy is big sisters. Um, we had many founding partners uh, to create the degree programs to hire the faculty to host the students and faculty before our campus was ready and begin initial collaborations. And you can see the partnering institutions and nine of the 11 degree programs that they uh, helped uh, there. Uh, and we also started offshore research collaborations with a, a number of the world's uh, research elite. This is just a small sample of them, but uh, these people and their schools got between 10 to $25 million over a five year period to uh, work on the topics that we wanted then to import uh, to campus, you know, desalination, uh, batteries, uh, you know, fault tolerant, uh, sorry, drought tolerant, salt tolerant, agriculture, and, and so forth. And indeed, this, this group of initial investigators has been part of the faculty hiring pool after they uh, got in line with, with our vision. A third strategy was industry and entrepreneurship. And you'll see here about 40 companies that are part of the Kaus Industrial Collaborations partnerships. Some of them you don't recognize their names, they're Saudi companies, but many are, are multinationals. Uh, for instance, the second one over on the top, Sabic, is now the world's second largest materials manufacturer after BASF. Um, it has recently purchased six other companies, including General Electric's plastics divisions, and therefore it inherited six research centers around the world, but it's building its corporate research center on our campus. And this is the kind of thing that we're trying to uh, inculcate uh, with our start. Now, you'll notice uh, an absence of IT companies other than one in that initial partner. IT is not very big uh, in terms of a commercial sense uh, in the Middle East at the moment compared to all these largely petroleum materials uh, and other companies. But um, interestingly enough, since we started, two government agencies have been created that build substantially upon uh, the simulation capabilities that are coming to the country. One of them is CAPSARC, which is a petroleum derivatives uh, institute in the capital. Um, the Saudis uh, are used to having London and Zurich and New York set the price of oil. They want to actually start understanding uh, the, the uh, strategies involved in global pricing of oil. They, they after all, are the largest marketer and to, to a large extent do set the price, but now want to have in-house uh, PhDs working in the financial area. And the founder of that institute is the same one who founded our campus, namely the, uh, the Saudi Minister of Petroleum and Minerals, His Excellency Ali Al-Naimi. You see him on the front page of the New York Times with some regularity. Uh, the other agency there is the new Department of Energy, the King Abdullah uh, City for Atomic and Renewable Energy, uh, also in the capital, but also uh, in liaison with, with our university. These two, as I say, were started downstream of the vision of having an, an in-kingdom research enterprise. Along with the attraction of multinationals and large companies, we aim to start small ones. Uh, we saturate the students with short courses on entrepreneurship. We have industrial partners on the campus. We have 45 square kilometers, so they can lease and build their own labs. They can use our core labs. We have seed funding available to students and faculty up to a quarter of a million dollars on a competitive basis, and expert staffing for intellectual property, which is a challenge uh, in the Middle East, fundraising and so forth. It doesn't have the culture of, uh, let's say, Silicon Valley. Um, of the four companies uh, that have actually been launched so far out of many startups that are still in progress, uh, of the five of them, I mean, four of them are, are um, in uh, the domain of information technology. That's not a surprise. It's an easier 
thing to get started. You don't need to buy a lot of capital equipment. Um, they range from you know, sort of uh, social networking sites to um, underwater uh, you know, data gathering and, and uh, photography with um, uh, digital electronics, um, a uh, entertainment use of uh, scientific visualization, and a robotic cleaner for, for solar cells in the desert. <coughs> Um, the fourth strategy is, is shock and awe with respect to facilities. Uh, I list here our seven core labs. The Marine Science Lab just got a boat, an ocean-going vessel, to help with its own uh, sample collection. Um, there was about a billion dollars invested in scientific toys uh, for uh, the new faculty. This is, of course, our best facility. It was free. Uh, it's the largest undiscovered body of water uh, in the world, really. Um, very little science has been done on a rather still pristine ecosystem of reefs and, and uh, fisheries. And before it is too drilled, like the Gulf on the other side of the kingdom, uh, we want to have a very good understanding of its potential uh, contributions to uh, you know, food, to uh, energy through algae, you know, all kinds of uh, things that come from a rich, diverse uh, biological ecosystem that has adapted to rather uh, extreme points in, in salt and temperature and so forth. These are our IT facilities, the six-wall cave uh, called Cornea and, and the original uh, supercomputer. The, of course, you, you can't just turn scientists loose on such sophisticated facilities. You have to spend a lot of time training them and, and having in-house research uh, uh, support for them. So each of the two facilities got a core laboratory. This one was trained by IBM at Yorktown and uh, brought uh, to the campus to help uh, you know, the, the scientists and engineers who are expert in something else. Uh, get up and running on Shaheen. That was a bit of an introduction to who we are and, and how we got started in IT. Um, but you know, for all of us, what's the, what's, the, what's the real basis, the strong motivation for pushing uh, a, a scalable computing agenda in any research university today? Well, the first is, is price and capability, quite clearly. We've been through decades of thousand-fold improvement every decade. This in, includes cost, as you can see in the left column of documented Gordon Bell Prizes for price performance. One of those might have been Thomas Sterling's, who we'll hear from later in the week, uh, the, the inventor of the Beowulf cluster, and, and one of the forces to drive the cost per installed gigaflops down. The other Gordon Bell Prize, of course, is on uh, uh, total capability, where cost is no object, the government labs sort of end. And they're also a factor of 1,000 every decade, not on the LINPAC benchmark, but on real applications. Um, I always like to do this thought experiment. And I, so I'm, when I'm in the US, I usually use peanut butter, but since I'm coming from Saudi Arabia, I use dates. So it's a delicacy. At, at today's prices, you would just use it to eat. But what if you knew, uh, uh, you, know, you had the market insider knowledge that in three years, the price of dates would drop from $16 a kilogram to four? You would go around through the recipe books, figuring out how, how to uh, you know, manufacture foodstuffs, uh, replacing uh, dates uh, you know, replacing other sugars and oils with uh, dates. If, you, if your you know, insider tips continued, that in three more years you'd have another factor of four reduction, you would use it as a feedstock for biopolymers, plastics, pharmaceuticals, and so forth. If this, if this trend could continue, you'd figure out how to rejigger furnaces to eat your homes, pave your roads, et cetera. What's the point? The point is that if any commodity is predictably getting cheaper and cheaper at a fast rate, it displaces others, and that is, of course, the curve that computing has been on for decades, and everybody knows this in banking and entertainment and commerce and transportation and, and telecommunications. Who doesn't know it is the scientists, really? I mean, we're, we're, the, we're the conservative ones, but in fact, it's, it's a deserved lag because, uh, you know, computing has lagged its, its peers in reproducibility, you know, our, our archiving and, and, and so forth, and, and the uh, real uh, ability to, to, you know, take a paper and and uh, you know, apply it in another area. We are, of course, working very hard on that. That's one of the research frontiers of high-end computing, uncertainty quantification, reproducibility, and so forth. Uh, now, if you were to take uh, you know, this progress and map it into other industries, just think what, what a miracle it would be. The 15-hour flight from uh, JFK to Narita would take 1 20th of a second if, computers, if, if airplanes had kept up with, with computing. Now, we won't mention that the latency of the airport, like I.O., would still add three hours uh, to this one, one uh, 20th of a second trip, but that's another research frontier, right? Um, 
the, if similar improvements in storage uh, your, had been realized, your offices could hold all the text material of the Library of Congress. And if similar reductions in price had occurred, college at a private university in the US would be 20 cents today per year. So computing is, is amazing. What should we do with this power? Well, of course, we, we have been using it for capability. Nature is multi-scale. It soaks up all those uh, uh, decades of performance, taking their third root or their fourth root in you know, three or four space or, or time dimensions in increasing uh, resolution. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, a real, uh, it's, it, it's a real thirst to resolve multi-scale nature. Um, if we can uh, resolve many such systems, we can combine them, for instance, ocean atmosphere, terrestrial gas exchange, ice modeling, and build uh, complex systems without making all the assumptions of fluxes and, and body forcing by putting things together. And then if we really have a lot of computing, we can wrap loops around these to do the real work of science, to test hypotheses, to vary the inputs, to find the sensitivities, to optimize the systems. This is the vision. And for many years, that vision has been reflected in the upper uh, oval on this chart, uh, ra raising the peak of capability. But I think today, one of the main challenges is lowering the threshold of access. And if, if the upper ones are the grand challenge of computational engineering, computational physics, computational chemistry, and so forth, the lower one is the grand challenge of computer science to make all this power available at high level abstractions in uh, flexible ways uh, to a community of people that are really expert in something else. And we're interested in both of these aspects at KAUST, as are, of course, you. Um, and picking up on that last point, we could really characterize the, the modern aspect of um, research in computational science and engineering as, as heavily focused in scientific software engineering. We've been mathematizing nature for hundreds of years, uh, uh, making numerical methods um, you know, non-sensitive uh, to errors, stable, um, accurate uh, for decades through numerical analysis, pushing performance again for decades in computer architecture sense, and now uh, spending a lot of attention uh, going back really to the founding of NITRE-D in 1992 with the standards for MPI and PETSI and many of these other uh, workforce libraries to bring this power uh, to the scientific masses. This is the diagram that launched the SIDAC initiative back in 2000 by Tom Dunning, the retiring <laughs> director of the NCSA. Um, under, uh, above this uh, you know, flowchart, we could really put two loops, the validation and verification loop, which is primarily the work of the scientists and the mathematicians, to perfect the representation of physical nature in the digital world, and then the performance loop, the often neglected loop that takes just as many years uh, executed by the mathematicians and the computer scientists to turn the computer into a bona fide scientific instrument with predictive power. And indeed, you could think of the computer as a universal scientific instrument. Uh, our campus has three of these four uh, facilities in abundance, mass specs. We, we have uh, about 10 electron microscopes. We have dozens of DNA sequencers, both on land and at sea. Uh, we don't have our own uh, synchrotron. We go to Cornell or, or Europe for that. But um, the supercomputer is used by people in all of these disciplines, right? It's, it's a facility that boosts all boats. Um, and this was, of course, recognized in the quotation of James Langer the year before the SIDAC program first, first made it through Congress. Uh, the computer is literally providing a new window through which we can observe the natural world in exquisite detail. And this has been an inspiration uh, to these, these past uh, 13 or so years of SIDAC. Well, I come from the Middle East. How would uh, such scalable power be applied at an oil company? Well, first of all, is the most obvious uh, case is better resolution of, say, a reservoir in terms of length or time scales. Um, accommodate physical effects with greater fidelity. Oil is not some black homogeneous mob. It has many different constituents, different carbon length chains. Uh, it has water. It has uh, gas. Um, and to, to put in all the compositional effects soaks up another dimension, if you will, of, of representation space. Then, of course, we want to occupy all of the the physical dimensions, not rely on axisymmetry or slab symmetry or steady state. Uh, better isolate artificial boundary conditions, uh, you know, with, with many cycles of propagation, uh, you know, from un unknown data in that doesn't affect the phenomena under study. Um, combine multiple complex models. Uh, solve inverse problems. Uh, don't just run the forward model, but use the output uh, of, of uh, 
wells and, and data to improve those models and predictions. Uh, of course, uh, do optimization or control. You have many ways of exploiting a reservoir, many ways of injecting water or CO2. What is the one that will uh, produce the most over time? Quantify uncertainty with many runs to, uh, to use, use up the parameter space of, of unknown inputs and improve statistical estimates. All of these are things that you can do with a model. And we have to apply them to extreme uh, situations. These are uh, web sourced, uh, nothing confidential here, uh, maps of the world's largest oil reservoir. You can see it uh, over there. It's, uh, about the, it's, it's about 150 miles long. Uh, and it's one continuous pressure reservoir called Gavar. It has thousands of injection wells and thousands of, of production wells. It's been uh, in action since the 1950s, producing five million barrels per day for the world. It's about half of Saudi's output from that one reservoir. Uh, this is a tiny corner of Gavar, as modeled by the former um, Mega Powers Code and the new Giga Powers Code. And what you can see from this uh, real field data, these are production, uh, these are injection wells, these are production wells, are that the simulator uh, picked up that there would be two pockets of oil uh, left behind, and indeed horizontal wells were drilled and, and found those pockets. And that pays for a lot of computers and, and, and staff. Uh, but the exciting thing in, in uh, computing today is not just simulation, the third paradigm, we could say, but the combination of the third and the fourth. Uh, instead of having inverse problems where you output uh, some, some prediction, if you actually have some data to put in, then you can uh, take care of some of the uncertainties in your model, uh, some of the subterranean properties, for example, in the case of oil. Now, this is a non-trivial mathematical enterprise. It's a good interface between math and CS. Uh, because it's, a, it's not a well-posed uh, problem. But uh, we have a lot of different areas of uh, third and fourth paradigm combination going on in our research centers, particularly Ibrahim Hotet, uh, formerly of UC uh, San Diego and Scripps, working in, in, in uh, data assimilation in many aspects of geophysical uh, flows. This is a composite of nine of our uh, largest uh, supercomputing projects at KAUST, uh, ranging from um, molecular dynamics, quantum chemistry, ocean simulation, seismic inversion for discovery, seismic inversion for earthquakes, shear flows for efficient combustion, bioinformatics, uh, magnetohydrodynamics, and global climate. The SIDAC philosophy is many applications drive, they're built on a common base of meshes and intelligent agents and particles that can be supported by a common base of distributed memory uh, uh, math and CS algorithms. And one of our scientists, who came over from Rutgers originally, was a member of the, uh, the large uh, 2007 uh, Nobel Prize team on, on the uh, International Panel on Climate Change. And he's, his specialty is aerosols, which is very important to the Middle East because if we're going to invest in all these solar collectors and they get covered with uh, dust and airborne sand on a regular basis, that not only affects their maintenance but also their, their, uh, you know, their daily productivity in terms of diluting the atmospheric uh, Flux. By the way, a, a quarter of Saudi Arabia's land area could supply all of Europe's electrical needs uh, if, uh, if we had high temperature superconductivity or better storage. So it's definitely uh, an emerging area. So what are our plans uh, for extreme computing? And I'll, I'll go a little bit fast here uh, to save more time for your questions. But um, as Craig knows, uh, for many years, for about a decade, I've been working uh, with NSF, with Department of Energy, with NASA to um, basically try to establish some, some good directions for um, computational science and engineering in the U.S. These are all you know, collaboratively edited reports in a variety of areas to which we've uh, contributed. Um, and there, if you're interested in, in these, uh, you know, I would say mostly unimplemented reports, <laughs> you know, done with, with best intentions on almost an annual basis for the agencies and then gathering dust, then of course you're welcome to, uh, to uh, ask me where, where to find them. But uh, what next? I, I wanted really a platform to start implementing uh, some of this. So um, this is the vision for extreme computing, as, as we call this new strategic initiative at KAUST. Of course, it has to, uh, it, it really should, should wave the flag in all three of these legs of simulation data and architecture, although my own expertise is limited um, to, you know, to small pieces of this uh, you know, fork on the left-hand side. And shown here are different um, sort of methods that one uses, and, and most notably assimilation and inversion are a combination of the third and, 
and fourth uh, paradigms. And then underneath are some of the applications uh, to which uh, we, we you know, put these, uh, these tools at KAUST. And a bottom row is some of the agencies and companies uh, that are our prime uh, customers. So this is um, the target. I, you know, it's all work in progress. But the twin deliverables are the enabling and, 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 the, and the actual discovery. So the discovery on top, develop and demonstrate algorithms for scientific simulation and data analytics at emerging scales. We expect exascale by somewhere between 2019, 2022. Today's software libraries, as Craig alluded to at the beginning, are, are designed for something very different. We can no longer ride Moore's law. We can no longer replicate billions of cores and assume they're going to be synchronous or performance reliable. Um, we have to move to new programming models to support these apps. And the second aspect is, of course, implementing them. Even today at the petascale, most, most users don't uh, take full advantage of uh, their, their scalability or their on-chip uh, performance. And of course, this is the legitimate, um, you know, they have an excuse. This is complementary to their own training and requires this multidisciplinary collaboration that your community is so good at. Um, within the, the first deliverable, there are really, I think, four thrusts for architecture adaptive algorithms that at least we want to address. The most important one being the, the new rule of, you know, no more weak scaling with extra memory. You have to do strong scaling within a fixed memory with multi-core or accelerators. This is a challenge for sparse linear algebra or PDE-based codes. It looks much better for certain things like fast multipole and integral formulations in terms of um, the ability to to scale uh, with uh, respect to uh, arithmetic intensity as well. These algorithms uh, allow many more flops per byte moved, which uh, byte, my, bytes moving is the energy premium today. We need to build fault tolerance into the algorithms themselves. We can't rely on the energy expensive alternatives of the hardware or system software doing it for us. We have to partition today's codes into small safe regions that we expect to be executed as reliably as all computing today, and then some fast large unsafe regions where we can take all kinds of shortcuts and know that errors will be caught. Many of our favorite iterative methods in applied mathematics actually can fall very well into this category because you know, they, they compute a residual and the residual derives the new correction and if some errors are made in that expensive uh, correction, uh, they, they will be caught automatically. Uh, and yet we don't exploit this ability to, to do you know, the vast majority of our coding uh, less energy expensively and, and reliably than, than uh, now. Uh, we also, of course, have to uh, reduce reliance on synchronization. All the good algorithms in terms of multigrid and conjugate gradients and so forth rely heavily on frequent synchronization, which uh, will simply not be realistic with performance unreliable nodes in, in, in billions of cores. Um, so the, there are many implications of emerging architecture on algorithms. Weak scaling could keep going another thousand. Strong scaling is the real challenge. So you can do the real hard work of exascale with your local desktop and your, and your accelerator. Uh, that, that's, that, that work, when multiplied by a million, is the exascale system. Uh, and uh, I, I think I'll skip my, my little uh, foray into why sparse grids, uh, sparse matrices and, and, and finite element fine difference grids are hard. I'll just note that it's my life's work gone down the drain. I mean, I've been working on uh, Newton, Newton methods and, and uh, Krylov iterative methods and domain decomposed preconditioned iterative methods for 20 years, and I see that they are not going to make it to the exascale in, in the current uh, manner. So we're looking where we can make incremental improvements and even revolutionary changes in programming models. Here's an incremental improvement. Um, the, the irregular curve here is algebraic multigrid uh, in, in terms of preconditioning of Poisson solve. Uh, and the, the very steady blue curve, which begins to overtake it, uh, is a fast multipole method for solving that exact same Poisson kernel. It can be a preconditioner for something that's, that's a variable coefficient, but it's something that has extremely good arithmetic intensity. It has, it's much more amenable to asynchronous implementation. It's very arithmetically intensive. It's the ideal uh, you know, looking uh, kernel for, for the new architectures. And uh, these are some of the hardware uh, improvements that can be uh, made to the algorithm. This is a comparison of five publicly available fast multipole codes, and the one of my collaborator, Rio Yokota, is actually uh, the fastest one here uh, at the bottom. Another area of work is um, to move from regular uh, loops to data flow and to a directed acyclic graph evaluation, um, sort of a retreat for, you know, for 
three decades to, to the way, uh, you know, to the frontiers of, of computer science, but it's coming back because of the need to be more concurrent and less synchronous. So these, for, for a tiny little matrix uh, doing a generalized eigenproblem, you see these three chains of three of the four uh, arithmetically expensive steps. Right now, we would do them in sequence between different subroutine calls. And the width is the concurrency and the height is the time. But they can be combined, as in this figure on the left, if we could get all the data dependencies expressed in a proper data flow way. And then when mapped onto GPUs using plasma and magma, as shown on the right, uh, literally orders of magnitude of improvement are available. And these are, this, the top one shows some work on dense blahs, and the bottom one on some new sparse iterative methods. Uh, on the top, you see the original Kublas, uh, th that's here, the, the, the NVIDIA product, and then you see the K blahs, the Kaust uh, blahs on top, um, as we continue to, to evolve uh, linear algebra for GPUs. Here, it's more or less even draw uh, between uh, the sparse blahs of NVIDIA and our own research project. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done there on the sparse case. Um, here is um, an example of work stealing within NUMA. So you don't want to steal globally, that's too energy expensive, but you want to be able to, to fill up um, starved threads with extra work within the local memory. Here's some, some work by a, uh, one of my uh, Saudi women uh, grad students in, in association with the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Um, we also are very interested in multi-physics apps where the PDE and the molecular dynamics aren't co-hosted in a very natural way. And you can see here the PDE solution scales very well, strongly on Shaheen, whereas the MD solution is tailing off. And th these, these provide all kinds of challenges. So I think uh, the programming models will at first be message passing because of legacy, but must be stretched to MPI3 to, and to less synchrony. Load balance blocks, which are scheduled today with loops, should be separated into critical and non-critical parts. The critical uh, with schedule with, with uh, DAGs and the non-critical uh, made available for work stealing. I have some ideas of how that applies to my own methods that I'll skip here and just end with some challenge. Uh, this is uh, a list, maybe not complete, of the sort of software that's needed to do scalable computing. Some of it's related to building the model, the code, the mesh, uh, partitioning, you know, quantifying uncertainty, visualizing, and so forth. Some of it is, is related to, um, to de developing the code, you know, the, the, the performance monitoring, the the debugging and so forth. Some of it is related to uh, scheduling production runs and controlling the workflow and archiving the data and understanding. Um, you know, all of it needs to be ported to the exascale, most of it non-trivially. I have this tiny little niche that I'm interested in. I hope I can go around the room and point, point the laser and the rest of you are working on, uh, on all those uh, other uh, bits of the environments. So we, we are at the point of a baton pass, as Craig mentioned in his introduction, from the generation that rode Moore's Law and would, could conveniently work in the bulk synchronous programming uh, environment, the SPMD environment that we know and love, uh, to an energy aware generation that will really have to put up with asynchrony, uh, non-reliability of, of components, and uh, just the huge cost of, of moving data relative to, to flops. This is the team that, that I have uh, working with me now. The top two rows are students. Not all of the Saudi ladies like to have their uh, pictures. Uh, videoed in uh, Indiana, but uh, this, this is a great team. Uh, it comes from several countries, uh, Egypt, Lebanon, uh, Mexico, China, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia itself, um, Palestine, Pakistan. Uh, and uh, these, this is my uh, team of uh, research scientists and affiliates in the Couch Supercomputing Lab and some of our alumni. Um, maybe you can uh, join us in this quest. We certainly will be in the quest globally together. But uh, this quest, I, I like to characterize uh, with the same words that, with which uh, Kennedy launched the Apollo space program. Uh, seven years before humans walked on the moon, we're about seven years maybe before exascale, facing a similar uh, you know, amount of uncertainty. Uh, Kennedy said, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's, that's why to do them, because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, we are unwilling to postpone, and that we intend uh, to win. So let's, let's go at it with this conference. Thank you very much. Shukran. <coughs> and and I, I get to put in a pitch. Your office here. We're still hiring faculty. 
re recruiting students, recruiting postdocs, and so forth. So I'd be happy to talk to you about that today. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what does it take to uh, create a university from scratch and make it number three in the world in, in terms of computational power? What does it take to do that? Okay, so first of all, it was, it was for a brief time number three among the world's countries, but it was number 14. But you can always buy a facility, right? That, that only takes money. Um, we, we all know that that's hard to come up with, but that's the easy part. The hard part is getting the facility to perform at scale on real science. And that's a challenge that we all share. There's nothing unique to doing that in the Middle East. In fact, there's nothing more portable in the world than a Linux cycle. And that's one of our challenges, actually, because you can attract top scientists with an electron microscope. But if you build a supercomputer, they say, well, you know, I, I can log into Stampede. I can log into NCSA. Why do I need to come to the Middle East to use you know, supercomputing cycles? Um, the, the challenge of, of um, starting university, well, I could give another talk on that. I, of course, didn't start it. I was just... Uh, you know, adopted into it. I went originally on a sabbatical uh, from Columbia. I spent a second year and then I decided, A, I couldn't leave because the opportunities in terms of uh, the effort I, I had to make to raise resources versus use them was, was small compared to US, NSF, DOE, and so forth. And B, I felt that the institution was still fragile in the sense that if too many of the founders left, you know, it would look like the experiment wasn't succeeding. And I, I, I firmly believe that it that it was succeeding and will succeed, and decided, well, you know, you, you only live once, this is a chance to create history. What if the door were to close? What if the door were to close because the university didn't succeed as it should? Uh, so um, th there's, uh, you know, a real um, challenge, as, as you say, to create a university from scratch, but um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, good models, good big sisters, you could say, to lend both credibility and initial support. We, we were born with age, you know, we weren't born a baby. We were born, you know, with, with many collaborators, uh, m many research projects already going. Uh, faculty could, of course, bring some of their students that they had just started at, at the schools they, they came from. The hardest part about starting a university from scratch is the culture of the graduate students. At first, they think they're fifth year undergrads. They think they can go scuba diving on weekends and. Uh, you know, stuff like that, whereas they should be in the lab, as we know, seven days a week. And, uh, you know, they don't, they don't have older grad students to tell them to do that. Uh, so it actually takes a few years before the graduate student culture becomes like the ones at, you know, at Caltech and, and MIT. Um, there are many things that are surprising uh, on, on the organizational side. For instance, I, I thought it would be very natural to have a U.S.-type system of qualifying exams. My European colleagues said, what's qualifying exams? Get the students into research as soon as possible. What, what are all these extra courses you know, that you think uh, they should take? Uh, so th there are, I mean, and, and even though I've worked with many Europeans you know, throughout my career, I've always done it in the US. You know, so so I, I, you know, everybody assumed their own system would be the one that we reproduced. So it was a big, it was a big salad bowl as opposed to a, a soup when, when we got started. And th there are many such surprising issues. One was, that, of course, we were created by an oil company. Uh, the Saudi uh, you know, Aramco company, we at first had their procurement, their HR, all their processes we inherited. They were not used to ordering uh, math books, they were used to ordering valves. You know, so, so there were many things that, that uh, were challenging in, in uh, you know, establishing our own you know, academic uh, culture. The, the country of Saudi Arabia didn't have the concept of a postdoc in its visa or immigration framework. So originally we called them faculty and then we, we taught the country, hey, this is, this is going to be something you're going to be working with for a long time. Let's get these, you know, these uh, university ranking distinctions uh, clear in, in the paperwork. Um, you know, th there's all kinds of issues that are, um, you don't think about. Um, but, uh, you know, the ability to, to uh, answer a lot of questions uh, by default, like if you don't know what should be in the library, just buy everything. You know, that, that's, that's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> It's impressive that your graduate program has one-third women. Yeah. Um, in Saudi Arabia, are there any issues about co-ed classes or something like that? Um, so certainly, we're the only uh, co-ed university in Saudi Arabia. That was part of the founding document. That was part of the king's intention. Um, incidentally, uh, may I remind you that in 1880, Stanford was founded with a very similar mandate. At that time, all the universities that it tried to emulate, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Cornell, they were all male. And Stanford said, by golly, we're going to create a non-elite, you know, co-educational university uh, that's purposefully built to, uh, you know, provide on, on the West Coast all of those uh, great things. 
that, that they have on the East Coast, but, but do it our way. And uh, KAUST is very much, uh, you know, the king's own dream. It's, it's not part of the Ministry of Higher Education, which has its own curricular and, and, and funding rules, which would interfere with the, you know, practices that we wanted to emulate in terms of non-discrimination, merit-based promotion, intellectual freedom, all these uh, sort of real charter pillars of, of Western education. Uh, they're part of our founding documents. We, we, are, we live on a 45-square-kilometer uh, campus, which is big enough to create a, a mini international city. We can go out very freely, of course. We, 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 we love to mix with you know, the, the local society, uh, but we have you know, very strict entry requirements for obvious reasons. We, we might be offensive to, to some of the uh, native cultures, and we might even be a target. So uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a bubble. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one way. I mean, we, we can go out as much as, we, uh, as much as we feel. Now, in terms of what those women will do with their degrees, um, of course, many of them uh, teach in, in women's only universities. And, and certainly, as the number of universities in Saudi Arabia goes from about 25 a few years ago to 300, um, there's a real need to soak up a, prof a professoriate. Unfortunately, the people we're training are not ideally suited for those jobs because those jobs are heavily teaching load intensive, they don't really support the research culture. I mean, we actually believe that, and, and certainly plan to train students at the highest international level, and they should really go to other research universities. Uh, and so until you know, Saudi Arabia evolves more of those, probably a good percentage of the graduates will go abroad. Uh, Two-thirds of them come from abroad anyway, so you know, they, they will you know, in, in high numbers return. What's surprising to me is how many decide, hey, this country actually has better opportunities than mine right now, and ma many of them, especially the Latin Americans, have just you know, stayed almost 100%. Um, so, uh, but in terms of opportunities for women, they are definitely limited in today's uh, Saudi society. More and more are being created. Uh, it's, it's amazing to watch cultural change over a four-year window, but no one would, uh, no one would pretend that uh, it's, it's a country where women have equal access to opportunity. Um, my, my feeling is you have to change that from the inside uh, by creating you know, the obvious talent pool that, uh, that then can be a benefit uh, to the country. So it's encouraging uh, that you know, so many of them uh, can stay with, within the country and pursue a PhD. Um, I might point out that right now in the U.S. there are over 100,000 Saudi students uh, coming on, almost all of them on full scholarships, probably supporting tuition at Indiana as much as any other uh, place. Um, and, and they can get exactly the same fellowship to come to Indiana as they can come to get to Kaus. So why go to Kaus, you know, if you can, if you can come uh, and work in, you know, this kind of an environment. Um, but we do manage uh, to keep, for that reason, a larger number of, of the women Saudi students and provide them a Stanford-like opportunity without, you know, having to uproot. Thank you. Thank you. So